Hello and welcome to our first video lesson on Chapter 15, Oxidative Phosphorylation. In this lesson we'll be looking at the free energy associated with electron transfer. Let's first of all define oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative tells us that we're going to be extracting electrons. We're going to pass those through a series of components of an electron transport system, or ETS, and then they will finally be delivered to some terminal electron acceptor. Through this process we'll be generating energy, and we're going to use that energy to pump protons. So that's the oxidative portion. The phosphorylation portion refers to phosphorylating ADP to form ATP. So we're going to convert the energy that's stored in the proton gradient into the chemical energy stored in ATP. Notice that this is in contrast to substrate level phosphorylation which we've seen thus far, where we make ATP at the level of the individual enzyme or substrate. Here's our grand scheme for catabolism that we've seen many times. We start with biopolymers. Those are broken down to monomers. In glycolysis, we converted that to a three carbon intermediate. The transition step converted that to two carbons. And then we set it through the citric acid cycle. Through all of those processes, we produced reduced cofactors. And now we're ready to get the last bit of energy out of those reduced cofactors through this process of oxidative phosphorylation. We find that these processes are indirectly coupled rather than directly coupled. And we'll see what we mean by that in a later video. It's a very efficient recovery of energy. And we'll see just how efficient a little bit later. So it's the last phase of getting the energy out of those biomolecules. And we just need to follow those electrons. So let's just remind ourselves of the term. Oxi oxidation is loss of electrons, and reduction is gain of electrons. If we take them from one molecule, you have to put them somewhere else. The donor is in the reduced form and the acceptor is in the oxi oxidized form, as we see in this reaction here. FADH2 is in the reduced form. It will be oxidized to FAD. And we're going to take those electrons and put them on Q. Q is in the oxidized form. When it takes those electrons, it becomes reduced to QH2. So this is the full reaction, which you can think of as simply the sum of two half reactions. So we can look at one substance at a time. In this case, let's look at Q in the oxidized form. It's going to take two protons and two electrons to become ubiquinol, or QH2. Our goal is to find some kind of quantitative measure that will allow us to predict the flow of electrons. And that value is the standard reduction potential, or E0 prime. Recall that the superscripts not prime simply signify that the quantity was determined under conditions of biochemical standard state. And the symbol E signifies the reduction potential. It is a quantitative measure of the tendency of the oxidized form of the molecule to be reduced. In other words, how likely is it for this molecule to accept electrons? The more positive that value, the greater the tendency. And just as we saw in thermodynamics that there was an actual free energy change, or delta G, as well as a standard state delta G, the same is true for the reduction potential. There is a standard reduction potential, and that we measure under biochemical standard state conditions. But the actual reduction potential in the cell might vary from that. In our expression here, we see that the actual reduction potential, or E, varies from that of the standard reduction potential, the E0 prime, based on the ratio of reduced to oxidized species, and that on a natural log scale. Since we're talking about accepting electrons, this ratio simply represents the ratio of the concentration of products divided by that of substrates. In our expression, R is the gas constant, T is the temperature in Kelvin, N is the number of electrons transferred, and F is Faraday's constant. The expression can be simplified in cases where the reaction is performed at 25 degrees Celsius and by including the values of our constants as shown in our expression here. Again, the reduction potential predicts the flow of electrons within a redox pair.
Electrons will always be transferred from the compound with the lower reduction potential to one with a higher reduction potential. The higher reduction potential indicates that the molecule is more likely to be an electron acceptor and the lower reduction potential means it is more likely to be an electron donor. If we look more closely at, a, at our equation, we see that when the oxidized form predominates, this ratio of reduced to oxidized species becomes less than 1, and by taking the natural log of that ratio, we get a negative value. Since this entire quantity is subtracted from that of the standard reduction potential, it means that the actual reduction potential, or E, becomes more positive. In other words, the higher the concentration of the oxidized species, the greater the likelihood of its being reduced. This means that we can make electron transfer more favorable in the cell by increasing the concentration of the oxidized species or decreasing the concentration of the reduced. So let's look at an example here. We're going to look at the electron flow from NADH to Q, and we have a, a table here of standard reduction potentials. You'll never need to memorize this table, but you just need to know how to read the table. Since these are standard reduction potentials, we always look at the half reaction where the molecule, the oxidized form, is accepting electrons. And that's true of every case in this table. At the top of the table are those that have the highest reduction potentials, and as you can see at the bottoms are the ones with the lowest reduction potential. So if you'll notice here, here's NAD plus accepting two electrons and a proton to form NADH, a very negative, the most negative reduction potential, which means it's more likely to donate than it is to receive. And then here's Q, I've, out, I've boxed in blue here. Here's the tendency to accept electrons, a positive number. So if we look at this pair, then we can predict that the electron flow will be from NADH to Q. What is the change in reduction potential? Well, just as when we look at delta G, it's always the final minus the initial, and that's true in this case. So it's going to be the reduction potential of the acceptor minus that of the donor. In this case, our acceptor is Q, and so our reduction potential is 0.045 and we will subtract from that the reduction potential for NAD+, plus, and that's negative 0.315. Since we're subtracting a negative, of course, we'll add those two values and we get a very positive change in reduction potential. This is our assurance that indeed we have properly predicted the flow of electrons. Another way you could measure this difference is to simply sum the two half reactions. Remember though, if we sum the half reactions, NADH is going to be our donor, not our acceptor. And so we simply reverse the sign on the negative 0.315. Now you'll notice in our table here, oxygen has the highest reduction potential. And as we'll see in this electron flow, it will be oxygen that ultimately really receives those electrons. How does this relate to a change in free energy? Well, here's our very simple relationship. Whether we're referring to the standard delta G or the actual delta G, it's equal to negative NF delta E. In other words, it's directly related to the reduction potential, but there's that negative sign. So the more positive the value of delta E, then the more negative the delta G. That is, the more likelihood the, the electrons will be passed in that direction and the more energy will get out of that. And so we can predict the electron flow down the transport chain. In this figure from your book here, we're looking at the reduction potentials here. So we're starting at the top with very low reduction potentials. And then here at the bottom we have those with the highest reduction potentials. And so as those electrons are passed through the different components of that chain and ultimately to oxygen, that flow is directed by that reduction potential, ever increasing reduction potential. What does that mean in terms of energy? For each redox pair where we're transferring electrons, in this case from NADH to complex 1, 
then that gives us a certain change in that reduction potential, the delta E, and that gives us a high amount of energy released, in this case negative 69.5. So in each part of this process, since we're following the natural flow of electrons, in each case we're going to release energy. In our next video lesson, we'll learn that electron transport takes place within the mitochondrion, and we want to look at the benefits of that arrangement. That being true, we also need to see how we can move those reduced cofactors from the cytosol to the matrix inside the mitochondrion.